Thank you. Welcome to my talk. Instant Agile Team, Just Add People. I'm Simon Cohen. I work at Spotify. But before I worked at Spotify, as you mentioned, I'd worked at other places. And one of the places that I worked at, uh, we had a team of engineers where I was also an engineer. And uh, we were doing um, a bunch of different uh, stuff that had uh, some Agile practices in it, like we doing continuous uh, integration, we had uh, unit tests, we had uh, some pairing, we have many different practices. But we didn't use any of the teamwork practices that you would see, Scrum or any of those things. Uh, none of us on the team actually had any experience with it, and uh, except for one guy. And this one guy, he had a lot of experience with teamwork uh, and Agile practices, and he really pushed us to try and um, implement Scrum and do any one of those practices. And we always pushed back and we were like, we don't need any of your stuff. You know, we're productive, we're putting stuff into production, everything's working well, we have testing, we're you know, doing XP practices. Why do we want any of that hippie stuff that you're uh, talking about with all this Scrum and all these extra meetings and all these extra talking about stuff? We don't want that. But he kept chipping away at us. And eventually, at some point, he got us to agree to try something. And the thing he decided that he wanted us to try was daily stand-ups. That was the part of Scrum that he wanted us to start with. So we agreed. He said, all right, we'll, we'll run this for an experiment. We'll do it for a little while and see what happens. So every day for um, a few weeks, we would stand in a circle, kind of like that. And uh, we would usually stand in the same place relative to the other people because of where we sat in the room. And we would go around and we would check in and talk about what we had done the previous day and what we were going to do that day. And we would do that every day for a while. But then at one point, this one day, the data scientist that would usually stand to my right, it was his turn to talk. And he just he stepped back and he held his forehead and he scratched and he was thinking really hard trying to explain what he had done the previous day. Eventually, he stepped back into the circle and he said, I'm analyzing data. And he took the baton and just gave it to me. And I took it and I'm like, oh. OK, well, I was working in the same data set that he was. I was cleaning it. He was actually knowing what to do with it. But I was like, well, yeah, I'm analyzing data too. Pass it on to the next guy. And then the baton kept going that way. And you can imagine that basically for the next two weeks or so, that's what happened with the rest of the team. It just evolved into, yeah, I'm analyzing data. I'm writing code. I'm testing stuff. And that was it. It took us about four weeks until the whole experiment of introducing Scrum or any other agile practices for the teamwork completely failed. And then we stopped doing that, and we never talked about it again. So that's how I saw agile practices being introduced as a failure. And it wasn't until I had joined Spotify, and I was a year into my term at Spotify, that I was sitting on a deck kind of like this in California on vacation. And I was reflecting about that year that I had spent at Spotify. And I was wondering, what had I learned? What did I know from working at Spotify for a year that I didn't know when I was working at that other place where we tried to introduce Agile and failed. And I thought, you know, it'd be really interesting to try and capture everything that I learned and try to maybe kind of share it. Because people really like what Spotify does, and a lot of people from outside of Spotify, they don't really know what it looks like. So I kind of set out to sort of write a letter to myself, a kind of message in a bottle through time, to send to pre-Spotify Simon with the capturing of like, hey, Here's what you're going to learn after you have worked for about a year at Spotify. And um, here's kind of what I've learned. When I first came into Spotify, I mean, during the team, the first team that I started working with, immediately what I saw was a lot more structure, a lot more process than I'd ever seen. And the first thing that I saw was something like this, which you can see there. It's a Trello board, which you're probably all familiar with. And this is something that we would start using at uh, planning sessions, start seeing there were this notion of planning sessions. We would sit down every sprint, which is about two weeks, for an hour, and we would talk about what we were going to work on, and we would populate the to-do column. And then during the sprint, we would move stuff from the to-do into doing and move through that process. Uh, so that's a bit of a Kanban flow, but inside of a Scrum, because we're doing some Scrum bun, kind of like mixing it up. We don't really adhere specifically to how we do things. So after the planning, you see stand up. Now, you can see here there's a gross violation of stand-up rules. People are sitting down. But I guarantee you it actually works. Uh, and we go through everything that we've talked about, you know, the usual stuff in stand-up. What did you do yesterday? What are the blockers? What are we going to do next? And then we move on. We have retrospectives. At the end of every sprint, we talk about what went well, what didn't go so well, and what were the learnings and things that we kind of picked up along the way that didn't fall into these other two categories. 
pretty much every retrospective that Spotify follows those three categories in general. There are other versions of it, but that's, that's the main stuff. All right, so yes, but why? You're probably wondering, I know about Scrum, I know about Kanban, why are you telling me about all this stuff? Why am I here instead of out there drinking some really nice filter coffee or chai or at that other talk that sounded really interesting, but I came here? Well, that's a great question because when I sat down to think about um, that year at Spotify, I was really wondering uh, what happened in the first team that I worked at where Agile failed. We tried to introduce it and it failed. Why did that fail? And why is it working at Spotify so well? So one of the realizations I had is that there's a sort of minimal set of practices that you have to have. It's a minimal set of things that if you want your team to actually succeed and you want the team to actually observe that there's something useful in doing this, that you need to have these put in place. You can't just put daily stand up and go, that's it, it works. Um, and through that thought process, I also realized that one of the things that's missing a lot for me, and I think was missing conversations I was having even at Spotify, was trying to understand, well, why does it work? Why do I need more than just stand up? Why do I need a planning session? Why do I need a retrospective? What, what do I need all these things? What's the minimal set and why, why does it actually work? So do you want to know why? Can I get a hell yes? All right, good. So at the core of every high-performing team is this concept. This is the very, very foundation. What you do is you're learning, and you're learning to get better. This is what we need to do. Because one of the things that a lot of people um, look at teams and they go like, OK, this is a high-performing team, and they put a label on it. And that's not actually accurate, because the high-performance is not a static label. It's not like I have a team, the high performance, put the label, done. High performance is a dynamic label. It varies with time. Even high performance teams have uh, troughs and they go down in performance and they go back up. But what they're basically doing is they're adapting. Because every team in every situation that we have in life has to adapt because the environment, the external circumstances are always changing. And us as humans, what we figure out the way to actually adapt is by learning. We observe what's happening, we figure out what's changed, and then we change ourselves so that we can adapt to the environment. That's what we're doing. And the best way we know how to do that is to learn. So high-performing teams, at the very, very core, what you will see them doing is they're actually learning. They're actually observing their environment, they're actively scanning to see what's going around them, and they're using that to learn how to improve themselves. So what's a good way to actually learn? Well, there's this concept called the PDCA cycle. First thing to know about it, it's a four-letter acronym, which is fine because it's not a computer science term, so it can be four letters. And it's also, it's a cycle. And that's kind of important. You'll see that throughout my talk, that cycles are kind of a key thing to think about. The PDCA cycle itself uh, is basically four repeatable steps. First thing that you do is you plan. The next thing that you do is you actually do what you planned. Then you check to see did the stuff that I do actually produce the results I was expecting in my plan? And then at the end of it, you act or you adjust. Some people use it as adjust instead of act. That adjustment is saying, all right, I'm going to take everything I learned from having done and then checked on it, and I'm going to feed it back into my next plan. That's the basic idea. And you're probably all very familiar with it in how it looks with Scrum. The first thing that we do was we have a planning session at the beginning of our sprint. That's our plan for the PDCA. The next thing that we'll do is we'll actually do the sprint. That's the do part of your PDCA. The next step after that is a retrospective. This is where we check, sit down with the team, and we look. How well did we do? How close are we to the sprint goal? Uh, was the sprint goal effective? Uh, what do we think we learned about what went well? What didn't go so well? How do we want to adjust to the next step? And that's actually what you're going to get in the next one, which is capturing the learnings and actions from retrospectives and you feed them back into the next loop. And normal stuff that you see around these kind of things could be changing whip limits, uh, changing uh, behaviors for the teams, changing sprinkles, anything. What I want you to see here is that Scrum itself, at that level of that sprint work, is basically a PDCA cycle. That's what we're really doing. Scrum itself, the reason that it works, the, the engine behind it, is, is it's a learning tool. Beyond everything else, in my opinion, it's really just a learning tool. PDCA, in and of itself, um, is, a, um, uh, is actually rooted in the scientific method. 
in the scientific method looks like this. First thing that we do is we ask a question and then we set up a hypothesis. Think something will work this way. The next thing that we do is we experiment with it. We actually go out and we run an experiment. And all we do in the experiment itself is we're collecting data. This is, if you look at it, is really the do part of your PDCA cycle. We ask an hypothesis of the plan, the experiment is the do, then you move on to an analyzing the actual results. You're looking at it, okay, I'm gonna look at the results of the experiment that I ran, I'm gonna look at all my data, and then with that analysis, I can move on to actually conclude whether I reject my original hypothesis, whether I accept it, and then I can feed that into the next set of questions, into the next hypothesis. So when you look at high-performing scenes, and you see the stuff that happens in high-performing teams at Spotify, for example, when the ones that are going well and the ones that are working well, they are actually doing things that look kind of like that as part of their scrum. As part of the regular basis of working, they are doing lots of experiments. For those of you who are here for the previous talk, this is the same kind of concept. Constantly running experiments, we're constantly trying stuff, and then we're checking on it, and we take the conclusions and the learnings we have from what we checked, we feed it into the next cycle, and we keep getting better and better over time. So, um, that's kind of the idea of uh, how PDCA works along your Scrum. Now we can play a short little game. There's actually a secondary PDCA cycle that happens inside of Scrum. And uh, I have a little prize. If anybody thinks they know where it is, raise your hand. You can see uh, anybody? Any idea where there's a secondary PDCA cycle that occurs in our regular sprint work? That man wins the prize. I'll throw you a little, you catch it? Oh, sorry, close enough. All right, that's true. So, daily stand-ups actually, it's a little bit tricky, but what daily stand-ups do is, they actually start the PDCA cycle at the checkpoint. First thing we do is we get together in the day, we do the actual daily stand-up, and we're checking. What did we do yesterday? What's changed? How did it go? Are there any blockers? Where are the pull requests, et cetera, et cetera. Next thing we do is we act. Maybe we decide that we need to unblock. Maybe we decide we need to move something from doing to done, okay? Once we've done that, we make the plan for the day. We take new stuff from the, from the to-do column or uh, planning or whatever name of the column that you have if you're working with that kind of Kanban flow, and then we move it on into doing, and then the doing is what we actually do for that day. And the next day, we go through it again. Now, what you're seeing here is basically one of the main differentials between waterfall and agile. Waterfall is about predictive planning. I make a plan with an intention to try and predict what's gonna happen in the future as much as I can. Whereas in Scrum and in Agile, what we're really doing is we're creating adaptive planning. And the daily stand-ups are really a way to constantly adapt to what's happening at the micro level. The Scrum is a slightly bigger level. And then there are even larger cycles that happen inside of every company that happens inside of Spotify as well. It could be quarterly, it could be yearly, it could be any length of time that you need. And what I'm trying to show you here, and what I want you to take away, is that if you look at a lot of these cycles and a lot of these processes that we have, we basically wrap them inside of a PDCA cycle. What happens when we do that is that we're actually creating a learning environment around every cycle that we have. So almost everything that we do effectively generates learning. And we're very, very, kind of anal about it, making sure that we're always going through and checking and checking and checking. Whenever we have projects that maybe took six months long, we'll have massive retrospectives. We'll spend a lot of time looking at that. So the idea here is that you want to be able to look at the organization, you want to find where you have cycles, you want to be able to um, uh, wrap them in PDCAs so you can actually learn. Now, there's one other part about this that's really important to understand is that PDCA says that you need to start by planning, just like the scientific method. You need to start with a hypothesis. A lot of places you will see, and a lot of uh, times, even at Spotify, you see people that don't actually start with that. They just go and they do stuff and they try and they experiment a lot, and that's very good wisdom. However, there is an advantage to actually setting out with an explicit hypothesis. And the example is this. If I think that I found a problem, something that I want to change, something I want to do in the system or in my product or whatever it is, and I go and experiment, great thing could happen is I try something and it works. Awesome, I solve the problem. What if I try something and it doesn't work? Well, what you usually see is people say, then you go and you do a root cause analysis, you figure out what went wrong. 
Okay, well you could do that, and you figure out what went wrong, and then you do that again to try and solve the problem, and you still didn't solve it. Why? You don't know, root cause analysis, do it again. Do it again and again and again. And that will work, but that's basically trial and error. And the problem with trial and error is you can keep trying it, and who knows when you're gonna actually find the right solution. You will eventually, probably, because we're smart people, will figure it out. The difference between that and the scientific method is that we're setting up hypothesis. We actually have an idea and a theory of why something should work. And when you set up a hypothesis in the beginning of any PDCA cycle, and then at the end of it you check on it, you get this extra nice benefit. So you say, I didn't get the result I wanted. Why was it? Was it because I didn't do the experiment well? Did I fail at implementing what I thought I wanted to do? Or did I not analyze the situation properly? Maybe I didn't look at it, maybe I thought the problem was here, but really the problem was here. So now you have the ability to separate and ask yourself an even better question. How well am, am I doing in analyzing my actual situation? How good am I at actually implementing solutions? Those are two very different things, and by actually setting up hypothesis up front, you can actually learn a lot better, and you won't spend as much time on trial and error. You'll be able to also improve how you actually analyze your situations. So that's kind of important. And in terms of practice, whatever you do, make it an experiment. That's kind of the only thing that I, I can say about this. If it's a cycle, wrap it in PDCA, but whatever it is that you're doing, and people have said it here, just try it. If you can set up a hypothesis up front, set up a hypothesis. Don't spend too much time on it, but at least have some, an, some idea of what you're aiming for and why you think it's going to change whatever you're changing in that direction. So whatever you do, try to make it an experiment. Uh, that, that includes sprint work, that includes um, you know, trying out new behaviors for your team, that includes uh, uh, whether or not dogs should be allowed in the office. It's all good, it's all available for experimentation. I'm sorry? Explicit hypotheses? Sprint goals themselves are usually explicit hypotheses. We think that we're going to be able to move this metric, and we're gonna do that in this way. So those, those can actually be used, if you frame them in the right way, with a clear definition of done, you can actually use spring goals as an explicit hypothesis. I'm hoping that answers your question. Uh, yes, you can, you can use that. Uh, the, main, the main point of, uh, of trying to create the explicit, the explicit hypothesis is, as I said, is you want to capture what you thought was the actual problem, or what you thought was the situation. Because you want to separate what happened in terms of, I did all this work, but did I screw up the work? Or did I do the work right? Did I screw up the experiment? If you're thinking like a scientist, you have to screw up the experiment, right? Or did I screw up analyzing what the situation was? Because then you, there's different responses to both of those situations. And that's the actual value that you get by actually experimenting and by being a scientist, by thinking about that. So you want to be able to create those. Good question. Uh, great, you're probably thinking we're done. That's it, right? We're all scientists, it's great. Uh, we have high performance teams at the core that are learning, we'll adapt to anything anybody throws our way. Uh, we can just go out there now and it's all great. Well, no, it's not that quite that simple. Remember I told you I was sitting on that deck back in California a long, long time ago? I was also sitting on a deck and reading this book. This is a, a book that proves the phrase of don't judge a book by its cover. This is an excellent book. Uh, it's called Leading Teams. It's written by J. Richard Hackman, who was an organizational psychology researcher uh, that wrote this book sort of as the culmination of the work that he had done over about 50 years, five decades, uh, in uh, that field of organizational psychology research. And this book is all about teamwork. And he had done work in many, many different fields from uh, airplane uh, carriers and uh, uh, what else he's done? He's done like hospitals, um, you name it. Every other type of industry you can think of, manufacturing, all of it. And the stuff that he puts in this book is really talking a lot about the theory of what makes for gr uh, great teamwork. Um, and that's a theory that kind of applies across any field. And it, of course, also applies in software development and in the agile world that we live in. Now what Hackman talks about is this concept of effective teams call them highly effective teams. We usually talk about highly performing teams, he talks about highly effective teams. Now, that actually brings up a really good question. What's the difference between effectiveness and efficiency? Well, in the agile world, 
a lot of the stuff that you see us talking about has to do with efficiency. We talk about velocity, we talk about throughput, we talk about our deadlines, we talk about all the estimates that we're gonna put on cards or no estimates that we're gonna put on cards. There's a lot said about that. And efficiency is really, really important. However, efficiency is only one dimension of actually being highly performant. And effectiveness is something I think maybe a little less is said about in terms of teamwork, uh, not in terms of product, but in terms of teamwork. And that's something that I want to go through a little bit more in, in detail. Um, luckily, we have a uh, quote from Peter Drucker, who is uh, an American management consultant. And he says this, efficiency is doing the thing right. And effectiveness is doing the right thing. So as you can see here, that's kind of a, a big statement, but it's a really important one. So if you think about it, if you're working really well and you have no losses, no waste, nothing, everybody's at 110% efficiency, but you're building the wrong thing. Does it matter? No, it doesn't. You won't get any results. You're building the wrong thing. If you have the most fuel efficient car in the world and you're driving to the wrong destination, it doesn't help you. So that's the extreme case. So let's talk about not the extreme case of where most of us live, and we'll use a metaphor. Suppose we're all going on a hiking trip now, and we have this kind of backpack. That's our backpack. And we're gonna go away for a week, quite a bit of time. We're gonna need a bunch of food. This is our packing list, kind of like our backlogs. It's really long, it's really big. What do we do? We have this problem. We need to pack stuff. It can't fit. That's the backpack we have. Right? We can try and increase the size. It's not gonna happen. There's only so much weight we can carry. All right, this is it. This is the backpack we have. This is the trip we're going on. How do we do this? Well. The most obvious way that you can start with is like, I'll pack as many small items as I can get in there. Turns out maybe that's dried fruit. Great, now I have a backpack full of dried fruit. Is that gonna sustain me for a week of hiking in the Himalayas? Probably not. I need more nutritional value. I need protein, I need uh, carbohydrates, I need fiber, I need fat. I can't just live on dried fruit for a week while I'm hiking in the Himalayas. So I need a different way of doing things. So usually what we're doing is then we try and max, uh, sorry, we try to like max, uh, maximize our, um, our efficiency by mixing different things of different sizes so we can get everything that we want. That's what we're trying to do. But there's a different way of, slightly different way of looking at it and asking yourself the question is, what am I actually trying to do here? What's the problem in front of me? Well, the problem in front of me is I have a fixed size backpack, right, certain capacity. And what I'm trying to look for now is the stuff that I can put into this backpack for this one week that's gonna give me the best solution for weight that I'm carrying, for the volume that it actually takes up in my backpack, and for the nutritional value. And that's the key part about it. You want to see that you get the nutritional value that you want from that volume and that weight. So what you're really kind of looking for are these things, these energy bars, which are, by the way, available here in India. Um, and um, these energy bars are actually the solution to that problem. They are the highest density and the lowest weight for the best nutritional value. In theory, you could spend an entire week with a backpack full of just these. Not even full, that's the great part about it, right? This is what these energy bars are kind of trying to do. They're trying to give you the nutritional value that you need for the entire ride. Um, in terms of our backlogs, this is kind of what it means to try and be effective about what we're going to select to work on. It's not just about how many cards can we jam into the next sprint. We're really looking for these energy bars. We're looking for the ones that we can put in there that are gonna actually create the largest amount of yield, the largest return on the work that we put in. And the yield can actually be looked at in some way as the amount of, uh, of value returned over the time spent. And that's, that's the idea in uh, those kind of selections. Now in terms of what it looks like in practice for teams, this is, should look very similar to what you already know because there's, there is a lot that's said about effectiveness in the agile world around product management. There's, there's lean, there's Toyota Kata, there's uh, uh, value stream mapping, there's a million things. What they boil down to, and what you can see at least also in Spotify, is one of the things that we do pretty much all the time is we try to visualize all the things. Visualize all the things because what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture the stuff that we're talking about outside in the world. Our brains are actually better at being able to look around and once we put stuff around visually in front of us, it's easier for us 
to activate more parts of our brain to actually be able to make comparisons and make sense of our world. It's just how we're set up. And the reason we visualize other things, part of the reason of that, is because what we're trying to do is we're trying to actually sort them. We're trying to like figure out what they, what they are, and what, what makes sense, what order we put things in. So pretty much most of the time, in terms of the heuristics of what we're doing, is we'll visualize everything. Think about trailer boards. They're a visualization of the work that we want to do. But then we're trying to just sort those things for the top end things that matter to us. For example, n could be your whip limit for the sprint. It could be other things in other uh, examples, like in retrospectives, how many actions are you actually going to work on? Right? You have to choose. You can't have all of them. If there's 50 actions, you're not going to implement all of them. So you have to sort for them. First you visualize them, then you sort for them. And one example of an anti pattern that I've seen people do is say they can have backlog grooming sessions that go on for two hours every sprint, because they go through 45 things in the backlog over and over again, trying to sort them and update them. It's not important. It's not important because the next thing they're going to do is only whatever that whip limit is at the top of it. So once you have your new top, once you have, let's say, your three or four or five or 10 items at the top, stop sorting. You're done for that sprint. Move on. And that's actually the point that I want to make here. Save the rest for later. Don't worry about it. That's the idea of prioritizing. That's what it means to be effective with time. Remember, what we said is efficiency is about how well we use the time that we have. And effectiveness is about what we're using it for. What is it going to be used for? So we have to prioritize in order to, in order to know what we're going to use our time for. And that leads to the last thing, which is you have to get into the practice of letting things fail. That's the point of prioritizing. When we prioritize, we say, here's what's important. And that means that the other stuff is not as important. And that also means the other stuff can maybe probably fail. That's what we're saying. And that's OK to say it. Because if everything is important, then nothing is important. So you have to look at that. And you have to say to yourself, as I'm doing this, as I'm prioritizing, this is what's important for now, or for the next sprint, or for whatever time period. And everything else may be important, may not even be relevant by the time we finish the sprint, or by the time we finish this quarter. And it's OK if it fails, because we figured this is more important than the rest. And if we get this done, and the rest failed, we know that at least we got the most important stuff done. That's what you're looking at. That's what Theodore Roosevelt also said. The nine-tenths of wisdom is being wise in time. Effectiveness is all about thinking about how you're spending your time. This is a thought process. It's a bit meta. And it's another practice and habit that I'm trying to uh, have you see here that's really important. If you're spending your time thinking about how you're spending your time, that's good. You also have to think about then in another level of inception of meta, how much time am I spending thinking about how much time am I spending? All right? you don't, would you sit down for five days and do a planning session for a two-week sprint? Probably not. Maybe you'll do an hour. Maybe you do five hours. You have to figure out what's right for you based on the task. So that's, that's what you have to constantly be thinking about. Am I spending the right amount of time figuring out what I should be doing? So that's the point I want to try to make here, is be effective, prioritize, prioritize. It. Now, We've talked about those two aspects of being a scientist, of learning, and being effective. We also need to ask the question then, what do effective teams actually look like? When you see one, what do you actually see? Well, luckily Hackman actually talks about that, and he has the three traits of effective teams. Um, that's in the book that I mentioned, in Leading Teams. And they start with the first trait, which is uh, teams that are highly effective serve their clients well. These traits are things that you're going to observe about a team. If they're highly effective, you will see that they are doing this. You'll be able to observe them. So serving their clients well is the first one. Second one is they continuously improve. And the third one is the members of the team find personal development a fulfillment from work. If any of you are familiar with the three Ps, what you're looking at here is product, process, people. That's what they basically sum up to. So let's go through them one by one quickly. Serving their clients well. That's defined by Hackman as the team's output meets or exceeds the client standards. This is actually kind of a key point to understand. Your team itself cannot define whether or not it's doing a good job. Just cannot do that. That doesn't work. They can't tell if they're doing good quality work or not. That's based off of Hackman's work. That's based off of academic research. So who can define if your team is doing a good job or not? The team's clients. Whoever is consuming the output from the team, if the team is producing documents, specifications, shippable code, mobile applications, it doesn't matter. 
whoever is on the other end of it, who's consuming the output of your team, they get to define if your team is serving them well or not. They get to define the quality level of the work of your team. So you want to have that in your mind. And examples of doing stuff like that is user acceptance testing, which is the most obvious one because it's right there. You go to your user and user says, if it passes this level, it meets my standard. And then you go ahead and you hack on that and you're done. Every time your code runs and it passes user acceptance testing, it means it met your client's standards. So that's kind of an obvious one. A-B testing is a maybe slightly less obvious one, but how do you know if you're serving your clients well when you are building a mobile app and there's millions of users? You can't ask millions of users to give you acceptance tests. It's just not gonna happen. So you A-B test. It's part of what you can use A-B testing for. You actually look for ways to get feedback from your clients on whether or not the stuff that you're building is something they wanna use. So that's another example of that. And of course, you can just ask. Uh, and the infrastructure group that I've worked in, Spotify, the last couple of years, we do a lot of that. We send surveys. We ask our clients. We try to find out what they're doing and what they think. We ask them what sucks the most about our infrastructure. We keep getting feedback from them to find out where they think we are, where they think we should be, and how our quality is. So the next part, or the next trait, is continuous improvement. And Hackman uh, defines that in the book as the team's social processes for doing its work enhance the team's ability to work together in the future. It's a big, big statement. It has a lot in it. I highlighted the words that I thought were kind of important. We're focusing here in improvement for the team around the social processes that are trying to make the future better for working together better. That's what you're looking for. So this is about how people are working together in your team but the orientation is towards the future. This is not about tactically, how do we get this sprint right now or this meeting right now to go better? That's just the right now. What you're trying to do with continuous improvement is you're trying to help the team do meetings better, do sprint work better as a whole. It's a strategical move. That's kind of a mindset you have to be thinking about that. And examples for continuous improvement are things that you do for social processes are collaborating looking at the team and seeing highly effective teams will be collaborating. They'll be supporting each other. People in the team will support each other. Somebody's struggling, somebody needs help. They'll go on and they'll help them, maybe pair program with them. They're giving feedback to each other. Um, that's a great thing to see in teams. And by the way, we don't see enough of that, at least in the teams that I've worked with. Um, holding people accountable is also a very, very good one. This is about you said you were gonna deliver this and you, you didn't show up, we need you to do this. Or you're blocking my, uh, my pull request, I need you to unblock me. This is holding people accountable and it's a very important habit to see. So uh, you can see that people in your team, the team itself is not blocking for too long, or people are actually changing their behaviors in a way that's actually making the team work better and they can collaborate better. So that's all around continuous improvement. And the next part that we're gonna to go to personal development. These are actually going to be anti-patterns that I'm going to talk about in what you look at highly effective teams and you don't want to see in a highly effective team, but you do see in a lot of other teams. So the first one is senior over junior. Senior people are more important than junior people. They get the really interesting tasks and the junior people, eh, not so much. They get the scraps, okay? That's not good because people are not going to be happy. You want people, all the people on your team, you want them to feel like they're developing you want them to feel like they're actually continuously improving themselves. You want them to feel they're fulfilled. So stratifying your team is saying senior people get this good work and junior people are getting like all the other work and when they get to be senior, they'll do that. It's not a good incentive. That's not gonna work. You want your whole thing collaborating on everything. The next thing you see is secrets and rewards. Sometimes you have individual uh, incentives or compensation methods like bonuses, et cetera, that are driving people towards the wrong kind of choices. Uh, and that would look like stuff like, I'm the expert on a team on Jenkins. And Jenkins breaks all the time, so I'm indispensable to this team. You can't fire me, you gotta keep paying me a lot of money because without me, your team's not gonna deliver anything. And I'm not gonna teach anyone because I have the secret and I have the knowledge and I don't wanna share it. That's another big anti-pattern for the personal development and for the fulfillment of everybody in a team because it stratifies a team, it actually makes everybody compete with each other instead of people collaborating with each other because there's incentives there. I either get a better bonus or I get to keep my job, I have job security, whatever it is. And of course, never shipping. That's kind of a big issue. If you have a team that you see around 
that over and over again is failing to ship, or the stuff that they ship doesn't get used because their projects get destroyed or they get defunded or whatever it is, that's gonna be a problem over time. People on that team are not gonna feel fulfilled because you have to close that feedback cycle. I write something, I ship it, people use it, I get some kind of feedback. If people are not getting that feedback, then you're not gonna see people who are happy. And eventually you'll see high attrition. People are gonna leave that team, they're gonna get frustrated. So solutions around that usually go back to things like MVP. You wanna like start cutting scope as much as you can to start creating feedback cycles that are meaningful to people, where they're actually shipping stuff that gets used. You have to start looking into those kind of examples. Those were the three traits that, we, that I just mentioned, which were um, serving the clients well, continuously improving, and personal development and fulfillment. Now, what do all these traits have in common? If you look at them, those three traits, they're all actually cycles. And that's kind of an interesting thing, because serving a clients well isn't something you do once and you're done. Neither is development and fulfillment. Fulfillment, by definition, is cyclical. Like we said, it's a feedback loop. And continuous improvement, also by definition, is something that always is happening. So, these are cycles. What do we do with cycles? We wrap them inside of PDCA. Why? Because then we learn how to do it better. We learn how to get better at serving clients. We learn how to be better at continuous improvement. And we learn how to be better at having people who are happy and joyful and working and developing themselves and getting fulfillment from work. That's what we do when we see cycles. Now, how have we done that at Spotify? That's kind of an interesting twist on what I learned in that year of working at Spotify. Actually, now it's two years when I wrote this, um, this talk. We added people. And this is, this is kind of interesting, because what we've done actually with our Spotify model, uh, which I hope you are familiar with, is that we've created roles that are very specific. First role I'm talking about is product owner. The product owner serves clients well. That's their role. Their role is to nurture the trait in teams that says these teams are serving their clients well. They are delivering on time. They're delivering the things that matter to the clients. They're actually there uh, doing the job that matters to the team's clients. So there's a person whose responsibility is to nurture this trait of an effective team. The next one is an agile coach. The coach's responsibility is to make sure that the team is continuously improving. That's their job. That's what they're there for. And then the last one is chapter leads. These are line managers, and their job is to actually make sure that the members in the team are developing and that they have fulfillment in their job. So, as I've shown you here now, we've taken the three traits and we've actually split roles that are responsible for nurturing those traits in every team. Then what we did is we made a team out of that leadership team because we're all about teams and collaboration. And we call that team the POC Lock team, which is the PO, chapter lead, agile coach team. The POC Lock team is responsible for nurturing all three of those traits and there's overlap between all three of those roles when you really start to think about it. And there's also this section in the Venn diagram where they completely overlap. And where they completely overlap is where the POC Lock team really works as a team. And that's where all three of the uh, roles come together and they try to improve the team's work um, at, at every aspect of it. Now this, this is kind of an interesting part of the Spotify way of doing things is because in a traditional organization, you usually have one team lead or one manager. That person is responsible for all three of these things. They're responsible for delivery as a product owner and for the clients and getting all the conversations going on with them. They're responsible for the team improving because they're the team manager and it's their team. They're also responsible for the line management, for the individuals. And what you usually see, and I've done this myself because I used to be a traditional team lead, is that you have to make these decisions on a regular basis where you have to think about all those three interests at the same time and you have to figure out which one's more important. And guess what happens? Almost every time where you have to make a decision on your own about which one of these three is more important, you're gonna end up choosing delivery. Just because that's the primary thing you're gonna feel like you're held accountable for and it's the most immediate thing. If you fail to deliver this sprint, people will notice. If you fail to improve in this sprint, eh, if you fail to develop people, also, who knows? It's not very visible. So what ends up happening in traditional structures is that that one person that's responsible for the team has to manage the, the tension between all three of those interests. 
And usually, it's hard for them to see their blind spots. The incentives are set up wrong. And there's going, it's just going to be much harder for them to make sure that the team is doing the right thing over time. So um, what is it that I want you to take from here? This I want you to take that we solve this Spotify by having three distinct roles, and we have multiple people doing it. We have multiple chapter leads sometimes per team, not just one. It's usually only one product owner and one agile coach, but we can have multiple chapter leads, and that definitely happens often. But you don't need to switch to the Spotify model at all. What you should do is you go home or to your office, and you should look at your organization, and you look at the roles, and you look at the people, and you ask yourself, what do I need? Who are the people that I have in my organization right now? Or what roles do I have or do I need to create such that I can actually nurture all three of those traits? And I want to be able to create a situation where there's more than one person who's responsible for all three of them because what I want is I want the interest to be made explicit in conversation between people. I want the product owner to have a damn good argument why this time around we shouldn't try to improve the team. Not why shouldn't we let them fail this sprint so they can learn something important. Or why is this sprint more important than a bunch of people going on a training session that's going to give us a payback over time? You want those conversations happening outside of one person's brain. So even two people is good enough. Co-leadership is great. Product owner and then somebody else that may be responsible for just the coaching or for like line management or whatever it is. That's another common structure. I want you to think about it and I want you to make it your own. And I'm going to give you one example of how to think about this a little bit. What we see here is a basketball court. This is a game. So what can we see here? What do we actually observe? There's players. They have different jerseys. There's a referee. There's the hoop. There's the audience. What else do we see here? There's a coach, somebody who whispered that. What's, what's noticeable about this coach? First thing that we notice about this coach is he's wearing a suit. Why is he wearing a suit? I don't know. Maybe he means business. I don't know, but he's wearing a suit. So the other thing that's really important is the coach is standing by the sideline. A sports team coach never plays the game. When the game's going bad, you don't see the coach take the suit off, put the jersey on, go in and stop playing the game. It doesn't happen. Why is that? Because a coach's job is to stand outside of the game and observe. That's what the coach is doing. We as humans are not as good at being able to multitask at the same time, to play the game and to also be observant of what we're doing is much, much harder, and you're not as good at it as just totally playing the game and being totally immersed in it or being stepped back and looking at it and just observing. And when you think about the roles that coaches have in sports teams, they're usually paid for the team not winning one game. They want the team to win the whole season. It's not one sprint. They want the team to win the whole thing, right? So that's what coaches are there for. But when you're thinking about who's going to do coaching or how they're going to do coaching or what kind of coaching I need, you're looking for that. You need somebody who's not playing the game. And in terms of software development, not playing the game means I don't stand in the path of critical delivery. Okay? I'm not in a critical path, sorry, of, of delivery. So product owners can't do it because they're accountable for delivery. And uh, your engineers may or may not do it depending on how you structure it. But if I'm writing code and I need to make the choice between writing code or helping the team improve and observing how code is written, critical path of delivery is always going to win. I'm going to end up writing code instead of delivering. So think about it. Think about it in terms of sports teams. It's one aspect to think about. So I want you to take from that last point is be nurturing. Foster those three traits. Go back to your organization. Think about it. Look at what's going on and make sure that you do that. So to capture everything I said in this letter to myself, Dear Simon, here's what I want you to know. One, be a scientist. Experiment to learn. Two, be effective. Prioritize prioritizing. It's all about time. Three, be nurturing. Foster the three traits. Four, take the Spotify job. It's awesome. It really is. Yours truly, the future. Thank you. Could you repeat that? I can hear it. Could you please explain the Spotify Spotify word which you are using? I'm not able to get that. The Spotify what? Take the Spotify job. What the, does it the mean? The job? Oh, the last one? It's yes. just a joke. It's just because this is a letter from uh, my future self to my past self. It's just, if you want to learn how to uh, uh, have highly effective teams, join Spotify. You can see a lot of interesting stuff. 
uh, I know. Here. Trying to trying to work on it. <laughs> uh, you mentioned about never shipping products or never sh uh, the teams who are never shipping things. Yeah. So, what would you suggest for the teams who are into that situation? Uh, so, what I suggest is doing your best to cut scope uh, and doing your best to find a way to have impact in what you're doing on a shorter cycle. So, uh, my experience has been that a lot of times when you see people not shipping, it tends to be things like either the team is stuck in uh, kind of waterfall mode. Uh, they're like, we have to get all the data before we can go and we can make a decision. Uh, we have to architect the final solution before we can go and do something. That's like one, one example, uh, which happens from within the team. Yeah. And you have to work with the team to be able to do fast iterations and to be able to cut down what you're doing to start producing something that comes back and gives you a little bit more uh, experience. There's a good exercise for that, which I think is available on the internet. It's called Elephant Carpaccio, which you What's can that? do with an Elephant Carpaccio, okay. which is basically the idea of taking a very big thing and slicing it into really, really small pieces. And it's a, it's a facilitated exercise that you can run with your team. Uh, when done well, that exercise really gives you a, a visceral experience of, oh, that's why we do Agile. That makes sense. Because it's, it gives you the, it, it takes something really big, you go through it, and it changes the requirements halfway through. And it teaches you that if you're going to sit there and you're going to try and architect an entire system and build it for the next six months, Things are going to change in those six months, yeah. and your architecture is going to fail. And then what usually happens is you get like really, really clingy to the architecture that you had three months ago, and you can't let it go. It doesn't work. So that exercise is a pretty good exercise to run with the team, uh, especially if they have never seen Agile or if, or if um, they're if they kind of fell off the Agile um, <laughs> horse and they're like, yeah, they need to get back in there. And of course, if it's the it's the other side, if your issues are systemic um, and organizational because of other problems, you're working on the wrong projects or whatever it is, like they're getting defunded, or you know you're working on something that's never gonna get shipped, that's a very different issue that you need to like then take outside of the team and you have to work with the rest of the organization uh, to find even smaller things, whether they're tangential or parallel, or how to take that actual project itself and change it so you can get some small wins. You have to start the, the actual feedback cycle people shipping something that they know has meaning to somebody else. Thank you. Okay.